Dan here and we're going to be talking about the end times and I really felt like now was a good time to kind of lay out some things to help the body of Christ because there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's also a lot of people wondering all the things that are going on is this really really the end of the world is this really when Jesus Christ is coming back and I want to help clarify that from the biblical standpoint kind of look at that where are we in time and space where are we in I don't know the next part of our life I mean this is really going to impact people going forward you know when we talk about the end of the world or the end times the second coming of Christ there's a lot of confusion about that. And one thing I want to tell you right out of the bat, please read your Bibles. Don't get caught up in what other people think necessarily. Like I know, I'm giving my opinion, but I'm trying to encourage the body of Christ to get into the Word for themselves. Because the Word of God is our standard. It is critical that we understand that that's where we get our sources from. Not novels, not television, not speculation, but God's Word. And one thing that's very interesting about that, when I study the Word of God, I've seen people do it, I watch great speakers, how they handle accurately the Word of Truth, how they take it and they, they put it together and they interpret it for us and kind of apply it for our lives. But when it comes to the second coming or the end of the world, it's kind of like they forgot all the rules. The rules apply in Scripture the same way they do whenever we interpret any part of Scripture. Those particular pieces of interpretation we call hermeneutics or the science of biblical interpretation. And as we kind of go forward, I got a, a few scriptures for you and some things to look at, but we've got to remember that when we're looking at the end of the world, when we're talking about how this all is going to wrap up, the source is the Word of God, not speculation, not something that sounds good. It really is, what does God say and His Word about that issue? And many times what I see happen is I see people grab verses out of the Old Testament that are fairly obscure and make doctrine out of them. When, frankly, the Bible is very clear. Jesus said in Matthew 24, I've told you everything in advance. I've told you it all. So we really need to start with what Jesus said, not necessarily what, what Daniel or Ezekiel saw. Those books are actually kind of sealed up until the revelation of the end times. So we start with the very clear portions of the Scripture dealing with Christ's return. And Matthew 24 is one of the verses, one of the chapters rather, that really, really helps hone that thing down. When we talk about biblical interpretation, when we talk about hermeneutics or the science of how you rightly divide the word of truth, we must remember the word of God cannot be broken. It's going to be always the same. It cannot be broken. It can't contradict itself. So, But there are scriptures that are kind of, you scratch your head, so what does that mean? Well, when you come to those scriptures, really go to the clarifying scripture to really see what God's trying to say. When we talk about hermeneutics, some of the things we really want to look at is the verse of scripture, is it a figurative verse? Is it, is it a literal language use? I mean, is it a literal thing that happened? Is it a parable? Sometimes parables are approached like other parts of Scripture, when it's a parable, it really has one meaning. Sometimes when you look at Revelation, you want to know, okay, is that simile? Or does it say, this was like a bear, or this looked like this? Are there metaphors involved? You've got to use the same principles when you interpret the end time Scriptures as you do the Scriptures of any kind. Sometimes they're allegorical. Sometimes they're, they're riddles, and there's things kind of uh, hyperbolized, if you will. There's sarcasm in Scripture, matter of fact. There's uh, personifications. And sometimes God uses things that we're familiar with to explain things that we have absolutely no idea what He's trying to convey to us. Some verses, some Scriptures are poetry, and others are Proverbs. And those things have to be handled like they're intended. <laughs> a proverb is a proverb. It's not to be made massive amounts of, of doctrinal statements out of their proverbs design. Prophecy is very interesting, but it must be handled very carefully. The Bible's pretty clear. But actually, in the book of Revelation, it says that if you add to the words of prophecy of this book, you get added to the plagues. I don't think we want the plagues involved with that. If you take away 
from the words of the prophecy. So God will take away your part from the tree of life. So I think we have to handle, especially the book of Revelation, very carefully. I don't think we need to steer away from it, though. I think we really need to get into the book of Revelation. I taught it for like two and a half years one time, straight through to the church. And we'll talk about some of those things that I have discovered in the book of Revelation. Not to add to it or take away. So you got to read it the way it's written. And you got to understand, is what's written, is it something that's trying to explain something in the supernatural with natural things? John didn't know our culture. John's never seen what it looks like to, to be involved with uh, traffic and airlines and conventional warfare. And he's describing things in the book of Revelation that very much could be what he saw, but he had no frame of reference to really call it what he could say, that's a tank or that's a helicopter. When you look at scripture, it becomes very important to understand those types, and prophecy is very, very important. You also got to remember there's only one meaning to the scripture. There's only one interpretation, but many applications. And many times, I know I do this, I apply a verse of scripture, a principle in scripture, that's not necessarily the interpretation of that scripture. But there are very, very important things that we must do when we handle the Word of God. It's very, very, very important. One meaning, many applications. And, and when we, we look at the Scripture, there is an obvious meaning to what God's trying to communicate. We don't have to make it so complicated. A child could understand how to go to heaven. A child could understand who Jesus is. A child could give their life to Christ and go to heaven. They don't get junior Holy Spirit. They get the whole thing. There is an obvious meaning of Scripture, and it's not so diluted that we can't understand it. Matter of fact, the book of Revelation, it says that book is not sealed up, whereas Daniel was sealed up. Revelation is a very critical book, and it is understood in what Jesus Christ told us when he said in Matthew 24, I've told you everything in advance. These books, these scriptures, have to be handled within the context in which they were given. There absolutely has to be harmony through scripture, unity of scripture. There are consistency of truth through scripture. There's no contradiction. So if you see something, that maybe it looks like a contradiction, you really need to look at Maybe I'm not looking at that right, or maybe there's something a little bit different that I'm not seeing, because the Scripture will not contradict itself. It cannot be broken. The Word of God is true, and it will happen the way it says it's going to happen. One very, very important concept when we study this is the idea that if you have an obscure Scripture, that obscure Scripture has to come under or in line with the clear Scriptures. When there is a specific scripture that says this is what's going to happen, or like what Jesus said, I've told you everything in advance, don't be deceived, those clear scriptures take precedent over anything that is obscured or very complicated maybe. That would be a good way to look at it because a lot of the verses in the Old Testament are pretty complicated. And not only that, prophecy, it's kind of like a mountain range. You see one mountain, and then you see another hilltop and another one. But when you turn them sideways, they may be hundreds of miles apart. Not only that, prophetic scripture fulfills itself in the real time when it was given. Most of it does. A lot of it does. But it also predicts things into the future that can be seen later on. And the way the world works, wars have already been here, always been here. Famines, they're here. Pestilence, earthquakes, hail, all in the earth right now. But it does increase and ramp up towards the end. Prophetic scripture is kind of like that. It uses those elements that are in our world, and it actually, actually projects it out into the future. So I hope as you study that, we kind of give you some tools to work with. That you understand when you read a verse of scripture and it seems kind of fuzzy to you, Go to where the clear ones are. If it interprets itself as being, this is what I'm telling you, that's a very clear scripture. And I'm going to give you a couple of those the next time we meet. I want to just kind of lay this groundwork of how we work with these rules of interpretation and, and how we handle accurately the word of truth. But there are warnings in Revelation, like I said, don't add to them, don't take away from them. It says what it says. And when those places of Revelation that are kind of like simile, or I saw something like a bear, that's simile, because he really didn't have a handle 
of what he saw in his world to talk about. But it really means what it says. I'm not saying when it says I saw like a bear, it doesn't mean that was a bear. It's simile. It's like our language. We need to treat it very respectfully. Not only that, the Word of God is different than any other book. It actually interprets our life more than we interpret it. It really looks at our lives that, hey, is this how you're living? If it tells you that, for instance, don't receive the mark of the beast, because if you do, you'll be thrown into the lake of fire, it means exactly that. Don't receive the mark of the beast. Be very careful when people want to put chips in your hands and all that kind of Be very careful with that because the Bible is very clear. The time's going to come when we will be marked and the beast will mark us. And if we receive that, a lot of catastrophes happen. And matter of fact, the eternal consequences are grave. I don't like to mark my body. I don't like to put chips in my I won't put a chip in my body. I won't. I refuse it. The Bible says when you do that, you're not going to be able to buy or sell unless you have this mark or you have this, this chip or you have this, this thing on you that can tell them whether you have a virus or whether you can buy or sell with it. I think we need to be very careful with that because the Bible prophesied that is going to happen. And we'll talk more about that as we go on down through the, the time of these lessons. You know, in Daniel chapter 12, 1 through 4, for, I'm going to give you an example. In Matthew 12, or I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 4, 12, verses 1 through 4, he says some things very interesting, but they're kind of obscure. And not only that, he goes on to say that this part of that book is sealed up. I mean, it's sealed up to the end. It needs to be interpreted in light of Revelation. It needs to be interpreted in light of what Matthew said and what the apostles are telling us in the New Testament. It doesn't stand alone. I want to read a part of that to you, found in Daniel chapter 12, 1 through 4. It says, Now at that time, Michael the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise. Now that's kind of a peculiar verse. Michael, the archangel, the great prince who stands over God's people will arise. Oh, what does that mean? Is there something we can look into Scripture and kind of back interpret to what he's exactly saying? Because this, this part of the Scripture is bound up. It is sealed up. He said there'll be a time of distress the distress of the nations, it calls it. There's going to be a time of distress that's not ever seen since the beginning of the world. A real rough time. Even though we've had distress, we've had hurricanes, we've had viruses, we've had earthquakes. But he said, no, it's not like, it's like full-on distress of the nations. It says, and what's going to happen? Everybody who has their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life or in the Book of Life will be rescued. So there's a rescuing of God's people in this part of the scripture. Those who fall asleep in the dust of the ground will wake, so there's a resurrection of the dead mentioned in the scripture. He said that there will be some witnesses that those who have insight, verse 3, will shine brightly like the, uh, the expanse of heaven. So he's saying there's, there's these people that can give insight to the world on what's going on. And can you imagine being Daniel hearing this is like, I don't know what you're talking about. And it says that these people will lead many to righteousness, almost like witnessing, like they're bringing to Jesus Christ. Although he didn't know about Jesus at that moment. He knew about the Messiah, but he didn't know exactly how that was going to play out. And it says, and then in this verse it says, look, seal these words up, Daniel. Don't worry about it. Don't get too stressed over this. People are going to travel back and forth across the earth. That's kind of an unusual statement, too. Think about it. Back then, they weren't doing a lot of traveling around the world. But if we were looking forward in our nation or our culture, our world that we live in, look how much traffic and airlines and everything. People travel back. It said another verse that says, the next part of the verse says, and knowledge will be increased. Knowledge is increased. Wow. It's exponential right now. Knowledge. More and more things that we've never saw, they've never seen before, never even come into our minds, or all of a sudden we're starting to see it happen. Oh, we have cell phones and computers, we have things that are they're just never in when I was growing up, never in our minds. Never in our minds. Not until Star Trek came along and started showing us these wireless devices we're like that's never gonna happen. It does happen. Knowledge is increased. But he says, Look, Daniel, go away. It's gonna be okay. I'm sharing this with you, but it's not really for you. It's for a time in the future. And so that book was sealed up, Daniel. Now, when we take Daniel and look at it under the light of clear scripture from the New Testament, it makes a whole lot more sense. And we'll talk more about that. I just want to give you an example of how you use the New Testament, the, the clear scriptures, to look at some of these scriptures that are like, Daniel, 
what are you talking about, Michael, who guards over, he's going to rise, he's going to, what does that mean? Is there a verse in the New Testament that talks about that? Yes, there is. And that's the one we need to go to to interpret what Daniel's saying, because that's the way all hermeneutics work. You always go from the New Testament to the Old Testament. You always take clear scriptures to, to look at the obscure scriptures or the kind of the unclear one. But how many times have I heard even good intended preachers go to the 70 weeks of Daniel and start their process there. I really think that is the wrong way to do it. I really believe you take the clear scripture, the book of Revelation, the straightforward talk of Jesus Christ in Matthew and in Luke, and you look at what the Apostle said, especially Apostle Paul when he tells the, the, the church in Thessalonica what was going on. Very clear, very straightforward, and we'll talk more about that. You know, I hope as you go through this that you'll see something probably that you've never seen before. If it helps you get into the Word of God, that's my goal. I would love to see the people of God getting involved in their Bible, looking at the Word of Truth, realizing it has real-time implications. It has answers for a lot of the things that we're going through right now. As we do these lessons, I pray you'll, you'll watch over it, pray over it, and, and just get into your Bibles. Don't, please don't look at commentaries. Look at the Word of God. Use the principles of biblical interpretation when you're trying to interpret a portion of Scripture that maybe is not so clear. God wants you and me to be well equipped. That is my heart. I want you to be equipped. I want you to know what, what you're facing and how to deal with the things and the questions we're going to have in the next few years that come across our lives. Be very careful out there. Jesus warned us. He said the name of the game in the very end is deception. Deception. That people will try to deceive people. We're going to lay some groundwork on this, and then we're going to spread it out a little further. And I'm going to even show you how the Muslim faith actually has a counter to our second coming teaching, which their good guys are really our bad guys, and our, our good guys are their bad guys. But we'll talk more about that later. I hope you find this valuable. Like it down below. Uh, subscribe to the Facebook or the, the YouTube page or the Facebook page. And as these come more available to you, you'll get more lessons. I'm trying to do about 12 of them. So we'll just see how that goes. But I hope it helps you. I hope it encourages your heart that you can get in the Word of God. The Bible tells us the book of Revelation, it's a blessing to read it. It's a blessing to heed it. It's a blessing to pay attention to it. Don't steer away from it because it's a little complicated. We'll break that apart for you to kind of help you see how you handle accurately the Word of Truth, especially the book of Revelation. Till next time, this is Dan saying, Till all have heard and the gospel has been preached around the world. God bless you and have a great week.